All right, welcome back. Well, we are turning our attention now to uh, reviewing some policies, decisions that has been taken by this administration. We've got Adigno Agbaje, who is a professor of political science and the former deputy vice chancellor, University of Ibadan. He joins us virtually. Good morning, Prof. Thank you for joining us on the program today. Uh, good morning. Thanks for having me. Okay, now, a number of decisions have been taken by the president. Uh, the latest, let's start from there, um, yesterday when he did announce his special advisors, the first tranche, uh, much, some more announcements will be coming through later because the Senate did approve uh, a list of about 20 for the president and now this one. So, along with uh, the previous de decisions that he's taken. So, from what you've seen so far, uh, perhaps anchoring on this announcement of the president, what kind of atmosphere, what kind of environment, what do you expect, having seen some actions before now? Very much. Um, it seems to me increasingly obvious that um, the administration is setting for itself very clear goals and putting in place various mechanisms for effective governance towards the achievement of those goals. You recall that um, the president set for himself uh, five priority areas you know, in terms of security, economy, job creation, and culture, and infrastructure. And uh, with the latest sets of appointments, is actually putting in place uh, special advisors who are supposed to be like his, uh, his, his elements of his think tank close to him to advise him on a daily basis, largely unencumbered by uh, bureaucracy. Uh, and so it's not surprising that he has, he has appointed those people. And I must say it's a very good mix um, both in terms of the quality of those appointed, um, in terms of their technocratic capacities, but also in terms of appointing people to general governance matters. So you have, you know, the appointees with very rich backgrounds uh, coming into uh, special duties, communications and strategy, of course, security. Uh, there has been some, some discussion around the appointment of special advisor security. And then you, you now have focus, specific focus on areas of challenges, you know, in terms of revenue, in terms of uh, um, health, energy, in terms of monetary policies. Yeah, so, uh, I think yeah. Yeah. so, Prof, tell us, I mean, when you reference uh, conversations about the security component, what, what are your own thoughts on that matter? Uh, my, my thinking on the matter is that uh, I think, um, and this point has been made by one or two of the other people, mm -hmm. it's, it's important that the president appoints a special advisor, somebody he has confidence in even the seriousness of the security challenges that we face. It doesn't really matter whether the person has military or security or purely civilian backgrounds. You know, comparative experience shows that it's not the case that in all instances, only people with military backgrounds are appointed. Uh, it has been the case in Nigeria that, 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 has, that, has, that has occurred more frequently. But people also don't realize that even if you appoint a retired military person into that office, uh, there is bound to be some challenges in terms of uh, how people see their uh, positions and who they should, you know, um, report to. Well, you know, well, you know Pardon me, not to worry, we'll, we'll, we'll still have a segment, so we'll let those guys look at this. I, I need to just get your thinking since you referenced it in passing. But ASU, education, that sector, very critical sector, the education sector, because we spend millions of dollars, even billions in Naira, because CBN, they come up with this data time and again.
how much Nigeria spent or spends Nigerians actually spend on education, even in West Africa, in Africa, before they then tabulate and give us what we spend overseas. So for you, in your field, uh, yes, you did talk about the signed the bill on student loan. There will be implications for universities, uh, speaking on that one. So how did you take that particular decision? I mean, how did you internalize that decision? Because there are those who thought, okay, yeah, sounds, sounds good, but you are in there. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, as a student in the 1970s, we, we had uh, that kind of facility. And um, it was left to you whether you wanted to apply or not. But uh, along with that, also uh, a whole series of bursaries that state governments offered to their, to their students, students from their own states. Uh, and so for some of us, there was no need to take a loan because the bursaries were adequate. Now, the circumstances are different. Um, it's really unfortunate that um, our educational system has gone to the level that it has gone in terms of resourcing, uh, partly as a result of challenges in governance on the issue of education over, over the decades. It, it's something that has you know, accumulated over the decades. My, my take is that this initiative, which of course, by the way, started from the last uh, government, uh, the, the, the bill that the president signed to law uh, was processed likely under the Buhari administration, which shows a continuity in, you know, concern about education and, and the role and the position of students in, in education. Um, this is a step, I believe, in the right direction. The indications are that this may not be the only step in terms of resourcing of higher, especially of higher education, but it's a very meaningful and important step that tells the story that perhaps this government is going to take on, you know, critical issues from the previous government and make advances in terms of uh, moving the country forward in the very key sectors of our national life. So for me, it's, it's, a, it's a welcome development. There, there, there will obviously be challenges, but the challenges can be tackled as, as they come. Well, it does appear that one of the challenges we're beginning to see is, well, the bill, the, 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 the act has been applauded. Uh, that's the Student Loan um, Act. Uh, it does appear that tuition, tuition fees are going to be introduced into the federal university system. And it looks like that is not very pleasant news for both members of the academic union and even students as well. Um, do you think that this was a Greek gift? Uh, well, I, I wouldn't agree that this was a Greek gift. Um, I think what we all face as citizens and as government is that we need to be uh, very innovative in terms of uh, how we address our fundamental challenges. Um, of course, every gift will come with its pluses and its negatives. And again, it behooves on us to address the negatives with a view to minimizing them and then address the positives they view to expand in, you know, the dynamics of opportunities that we have to move forward. Uh, of course, the whole issue of uh, resourcing education is not just about um, the fiscal, uh, the, the lack of money. It's also about a whole barrage of other uh, policies, the intractable issue of corruption in the polity. It's become evidence points to a very serious challenge that is multidimensional. Because if you look at the leakages from our public finance system arising from corruption, I believe those leakages will go a long way by addressing the scarcity of resources in our higher education. So what we need is a government that is able to address all of these holistically 
so that you don't place all of the burden on the less privileged members of society who are also in the majority. Um, so what I would say is that this is a step in the right direction, but I only make more uh, impact when we begin to address all, at least the majority of the leakages in our economy, to the extent that a lot of these leakages are not even according to reports, fully reported, and the leakages continue. So again, it boils down to the whole issue. You are asking perhaps now students and parents to bear more responsibility. But as a government, and I say government at all levels, you also have to take on more responsibilities as managers of the Nigerian state to ensure that the state is able to effectively fight back and reduce the flow of resources away from our country and our critical areas of national life arising from corruption. We need to stop paying lip service. And once you do that, then people will be able to, uh, you know, be happy to make the kinds of uh, sacrifices that, uh, you know, we are now asking them to make uh, without any reservation. But once the, this, the evidence of corruption continues, or we don't see elements of, you know, addressing of the corruptions of the past, the present, and plan effectively for the future, then, you know, as a political scientist, I can see that we still have some challenges in, in the future, including the very immediate future. Well, Prof, I, I, do, I do not know whether conversations have started within ASU. I imagine that lecturers might be speaking informally, perhaps one to the other, about the slew of uh, policies we've seen in recent times, the removal of fuel subsidy, how that is going to affect, say, the university community. Um, there's also the floating of the Naira. And now, with this imminent introduction of tuition fees, uh, it does appear that, you know, there's quite a lot for the, for the Nigerian who has children in, in the university to take on. Uh, can you tell us, if one, if there's been a formal start of conversations within ASU as to what this will mean? Uh, and if it hasn't started, what are your colleagues saying in informal quarters about the slew of uh, policies that we've seen in recent times? Very much. If I can just uh, take the risk, since I'm not uh, a spokesperson formally for ASU, uh, I believe the conversation is already on. In fact, the conversation precedes uh, the current uh, you know, slew of policies as you do them, and it's, it's been on for a long time. Uh, what we expect is that um, over time, of course, the, you, there is no uniformity in terms, you cannot say that all of us who uh, support these or that, uh, that's the beauty of a plural uh, society. Uh, but uh, what we are hoping to see okay. is a situation in which increasingly people are saying that we must get these resources. If, if, if the resources will not come from paying fees, they have to come from somewhere. And it may not be sustainable to hold on to the argument that... Uh, let, let me just jump in so you can make this point alongside what you're saying, if you can, or will. Um, now, yes, you say resources won't just come from those fees. It's got to look elsewhere. But we also do know that several governments, even though they signed those agreements, they've not been able to fulfill the obligations with ASU. So will this or shouldn't this lead to financial autonomy for universities? Would that be a way to go? Yes, I believe that we're already there in, in principle. Um, but of course, to the extent that uh, a lot of the overheads in the university system are provisioned by the owners of federal universities, the federal government, uh, state government universities, and then of course, private universities. I think what we need to seriously tackle is the, and also thinking beyond the box, is the whole issue of, can you have education that is 
totally tuition free. Let me say that fees are already being charged even in federal universities. Um, the, 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 the key area that's largely left is in the area of the fees. Comparatively, in the global sense, uh, increasingly we are getting to know that uh, education is relatively cheap in Nigeria. Uh, when our children go abroad, these people who have taken loans over the years to fund their own education, and then they spend the next 10, 15 years paying back the loan. Those are the realities. But in the context of our own specific realities, like as I said earlier, as we move towards the possibility of a fee, tuition fee paying regime for government, for federal government universities, don't forget that state government universities, most of them, if not all, are already paying tuition fees. That we also address other policy issues, as I said earlier. Um, if, for instance, just hypothetically, you are talking about raising tuition fees of 100 naira, but you are also losing 300 naira to corruption uh, that is largely untamed, then, you know, that calls to question our capacity to think holistically and to address the fundamentals of our reality instead of shifting responsibility. Uh, to others who are non-state uh, uh, actors. So th th that would be my, my take. A need for complementary policies that will then make it easy for people to say, yes, the state is not that irresponsible in terms of our resources. And so we can contribute more resources to health, to education, and even to infrastructure. You talk about... Uh you know, corruption, you know, taking, saving money and then, you know, losing money to corruption. Uh, the question that comes to mind for me is how we deal with that. For instance, I remember in the days of former Vice President Osibajo, he has advocated that, look, we need to do something about the civil service uh, at the federal level because that's uh, where government really happens, or governance really happens. They execute everything that needs to be done. But there are those who also say that that is where a lot of corrupt act activities happen. Do you see a situation where we run a paperless government, uh, a situation where we digitize processes and procedures in government at all levels, ministries, departments, and agencies? Because there are those who believe that it is in the place of moving paper from one desk to the other that something has to exchange hands, otherwise nothing will happen. Do you see that happening uh, as part of the president's guiding principles when he talked about, look, we need to do something about discouraging corruption? Do you think that will discourage corruption, digitizing public service? Let me say that, sir. It's unfortunate we are the state where we're seeing that you see digitization happening in Nigeria. I will give an example of Kenya, where they have service centers in every local government, where whatever you want to do, whatever service you want from government, you go to those service centers and you can do everything. Vehicle licensing, tax, Name any kind of payment you want to make uh, in terms of government service, and everything is digital. You don't have to, to you want to register your new car, you want anything you want at all local government levels. It is, it is a, it's a one-stop service center. Uh, digitization has progressed tremendously in many other African countries that are not as, uh, as I don't want to say rich as blessed as Nigeria, in terms of resources of all types, human resources, the capacity, the human capacity. I mean, we drive the economies and the governance of a lot of countries in the world. Nigerians are there. So I, I'm, I'm always sad when I'm asked, can we, is it possible in Nigeria? We are the leader naturally, but we have been left behind by decades as a result of inaction or action that actually perpetuates evil. All right, Prof, we, 
We just need to anchor at this point. Anchor at this point. Uh, we do appreciate your perspectives. Adigun Agbaje, Professor of Political Science, former Deputy Vice Chancellor, University of Ibadan. Thank you very much indeed for your time today. Thank you very much.